Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the latest in our series of ENA Center for Transportation webinars. Today we're going to be discussing urban mobility data sharing with Regina Clulo. Dr. Clulo is a leading expert on shared mobility, automated vehicles, and the use of big data in transportation. She has served in research and lecture roles at Stanford, UC Davis, UC Berkeley, and also as the Director of Business and Development and Strategy at Mobile. Regina is now the CEO and co-founder of Populous, a platform for city mobility data management. Uh, today, Regina is going to discuss mobility data sharing, including dynamics between public and private entities, and give some examples of how cities are using data for policy and planning. We're going to have plenty of time for questions at the end. Please feel free to enter questions in the question box on the side of your screen at any time, and we will get to as many as possible after the presentation. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to you, Regina. Great. Thank you so much, Alice. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Um, I, as you know, I've spent a large portion of my career as an academic, and so the Eno you know, Center for Transportation is a longstanding leader uh, supporting transportation research and policy. Um, and it's wonderful to, to present a quick overview here of mobility data sharing and how quickly the transportation landscape is, is changing. Um, over the past 20 years, uh, as many folks probably on this call know very well, we've seen dramatic growth and evolution of shared mobility services in cities. Um, from the early versions of station-based car sharing, such as Zipcar, to the arrival of Uber and Lyft, we saw more private fleet operators introduce different business models for moving people uh, in cities that didn't require vehicle ownership. Um, if you fast forward now to the end of 2017 and early 2018, uh, what we've more recently seen is the rise of micromobility, uh, that is bikes and scooters, which expanded quite rapidly over the last 18 months. Um, dockless bike and scooter companies such as Bird, Lime, and Spin are now in over 300 cities around the world. And I think that many of us um, have to keep in mind um, as we think about our transportation ecosystem um, in the United States, we still nearly have about 50% of trips that are three miles or less, and almost 80% of those are still being made in a car. So there's still a huge market potential for these newer um, small services. As various new mobility services have been um, introduced in cities, particularly over the past 10 years, I, a lot of cities, I think, have been frustrated with the lack of information that they have um, about these private services. Uh, many cities and public agencies have been uh, unable to answer questions about whether or not these services are improving safety, how they might be changing traffic patterns, um, or whether or not they're expanding transportation services uh, to the underserved. Uh, I personally believe that the rapid innovation that's been introduced to the transportation space has been hugely beneficial because suddenly we have significantly more resources to work with to solve our city's transportation problems. Uh, transportation is still um, in the United States and particularly in California one of the largest sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we haven't made a lot of progress on this problem, um, but we do also have to remember that private companies are not naturally incentivized to reduce traffic and improve safety. Um, these are societal goals, and they're ones that I believe public agencies are primarily responsible for measuring progress towards. And that is the fundamental reason why many cities are beginning to ask um, these private operators, fleet operators, for data. Um, there are probably quite a few people out there who perhaps find it hard to take scooters seriously, maybe. Um, but I'm going to describe why the arrival of e-scooters was um, a pretty significant game changer, particularly in the context of mobility data sharing. Uh, many cities um, had learned from prior experiences with private mobility services, um, for example, Uber and Lyft, where the vast majority of cities still have pretty limited access to information and data about how these services operate and how they change um, how people are moving in cities. Um, many cities in the United States that I spoke with when I was a transportation researcher um, had heard stories about dockless bike share in China and were basically preparing for what they expected would be a wave of dockless bike share in the United States in the 2017 timeframe. Um, those bikes somehow morphed into scooters in the United States, but uh, regardless, many cities such as Seattle and Washington, D.C. had already put in place data sharing requirements for dockless bike share uh, 
um, that they then, uh, some, for instance, DC expanded to scooters. And then many of the scooter uh, permit policies that were adopted um, across the United States over the past year um, were in many cases based off of those original permits that were originally designed for dockless bike share. Um, dockless mobility, um, bikes and scooters, are fairly easily regulated because the vehicles are mostly owned by fleet operators and they can be confiscated. And so I think many of these operators have seen that it's very difficult to um, operate a service without coordination with the city. Um, and these companies aren't able to now operate in the public right of way typically without following um, the rules that a city puts in place to manage them. And that's a very different circumstance from how previous mobility services um, had arrived. So I'm going to dive now deeper into mobility data sharing to describe um, precisely how it is that cities are able to receive data from these growing fleets of private operators. Um, in terms of a regulatory mechanism, I, I just mentioned most cities have a permit that they have established that sets forth the basic rules of the road um, for scooter companies, for example, including a potential cap on vehicles, insurance requirements, and now data sharing requirements. Uh, which typically require that providers deliver data to the city um, through two key standards that are now commonly being used. Um, the first is GBFS, the General Bike Share Feed Specification, uh, which was originally developed by NAPSA, the North American Bike Share Association, several years ago um, between partnerships uh, from Motivate, uh, which is now owned by Lyft, uh, the Dock to Bike Sharing Service that is in Chicago and New York and many other major U.S. cities, and the public agencies. Um, that we're, we're managing those services. A few key things to know about GBFS is that it was designed primarily to share information about available vehicles. Uh, so if you're a consumer and you want to know how many bikes are in a, a dock station, you can look that up on an app. Um, it then expanded to dockless bike share and then scooter share on its own, and now there's a new effort um, to update GBFS uh, through the North American Bike Share Association. Um, that's a multi-stakeholder group that's being led by a consulting firm. In Los Angeles last year, LADOT introduced what's, now, what's known as the Mobility Data Specification, or MDS, which was built for operators to communicate with cities, um, but also for cities to communicate back to operators. Uh, for the most part, what we've seen in the vast majority of cities is that most cities are using MDS as a requirement to receive information from operators, not necessarily to also communicate back. And if you're interested in further information on this topic, there are a couple of blog posts that we've put together on the Populous um, blog site, as well as there's a Forbes article from this past August if you want to dive further into the details of mobility data standards. What we've seen over the last 12 months um, to 18 months is that there are three typical approaches that cities and other public agencies are using to obtain data from private operators. The first is that previously many cities and public agencies were bringing in pre-aggregated data that was reported by the mobility operators. Many car sharing permits for services such as car to go operated in this fashion. Um, and this was also the method for um, the, Depart the District Department of Transportation in DC, original reporting method for dockless bike share and scooter share. Um, what we've seen emerge over the last 12 months um, is this model of having the data be delivered through a trusted third party. Um, this has become pretty common. Uh, Populous is now delivering this type of service in over 50 cities, whereby we as a company receive the data from private operators through established open standards, such as GBFS or MDS, um, and then we deliver a SaaS solution to a city so that they can easily visualize, analyze, and make use of that data and turn it into information. Um, and then the third model is that some cities are also directly receiving raw disaggregated data um, directly from private operators. So now I'll step through some of the pros and cons of um, these different methods. Um, the first of having aggregated data reported by mobility operators, one of the real benefits is that the entire reporting burden is basically placed on the operator. And so the city bears very little risk um, that might emerge when you think about data privacy and security issues. Um, however, um, I think a lot of cities also 
were concerned that they weren't receiving transparent data and information um, and felt that they needed more information from those operators. So the second solution that emerged um, for many cities is this third party option, um, whereby then cities now can trust that the data is audited and verified through an unbiased party. Um, in this scenario, the city also continues to bear little risk um, and most cities find that this is a very cost-effective me method than doing their own analytics. Um, for instance, we ingest MDS data all day, every day, in over 50 cities now. So many cities find that we can do this pretty efficiently and cost-effectively than if they were to do this analysis in-house. Um, and then finally, this last option of cities directly receiving raw disaggregate data, um, the real main advantage is that you have a lot more flexibility to do as you please um, with the data. Um, one of the key issues that's definitely emerged over the last year um, as more data has been free flowing from private operators to public to the public sector um, are concerns around data privacy um, and security, which I'll dive into um, in, in a minute. And if you look at these three different solutions, um, the pre-aggregated reported by mobility operator solution um, certainly imposes the least risk on the city, whereas directly ingesting huge amounts of data uh, some of which might be considered personal bears the most risk um, to the public sector. So diving a bit further into that topic, um, there's been a lot in the news media over the last six months about mobility data sharing. I'm going to take a moment to dive into some of the key issues. So prior to forming Populous, I was a transportation researcher in the realm of travel demand modeling. Um, and so I was quite familiar with the issue of mobility data and GPS uh, breadcrumb trace data, um, where it is pretty clear that you can use that information to re-identify individuals. You can combine it with other data sets um, and, and learn um, a significant amount potentially about a person's whereabouts. Um, and so that's really the key issue with data that's now being shared between private operators and cities and other public agencies is that this trip data, including origins, destinations, and this breadcrumb trace data, um, in many cases could potentially be considered personal information. Uh, many of the newer privacy policies, such as GDPR in Europe and um, CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act in California, are starting to change how companies and other organizations treat this type of information. Um, and in the case of GDPR, for instance, specifically labeling location data as personal information um, that should be treated similarly to how you would treat um, a person's um, identifier in a, in a country, uh, their name, email address, um, et cetera. So many data sharing requirements have moved forward in the United States um, not necessarily with clear guidelines on the data security, processing, and storage or retention of the data. Uh, and I think this is one of the key challenges that's really emerged in this space, um, and it's one that we've been really actively working on at Populous. So there are a couple of different solutions that I'm going to dive into um, in terms of balancing public sector data needs and how we then also protect consumer privacy. Um, the first is really securing access to data. Um, there initially many GBFS data feeds um, were required to be open. Um, there's a conversation about whether those data streams should be open and accessible to anyone. Um, if there's information being transmitted through those data feeds, that could be used to re-identify specific individuals. Um, the second key issue is data license agreements. Um, so specifically outlining how data should be stored, how it should be processed. Um, what are the data retention requirements? Um, should that data be purged after a certain period of time? Um, much of that in many cases has been undefined. And so now cities um, and companies like Populous are working together through SAE to start thinking about some of those issues. So I'm not gonna dive into those two top issues in much detail, um, but now I really wanna shift into focusing on what are robust third party solutions that cities can utilize and Specifically, how can we take this information um, to guide decision making? Because cities don't want data for the sake of having data. Uh, cities want data for the purposes of driving progress towards public goals. So at Populous, we founded our company about two years ago, and um, our team was founded by transportation and urban planning PhDs from UC Berkeley and MIT. 
Um, we're now hosting data from the world's largest mobility operators, um, scooter companies and companies that operate other services, and we're delivering it in 50 plus cities around the world. Um, we do harness and contribute to these open source data specifications that I described. Um, and what we're finding is that cities are now able to make much better decisions about managing mobility services. Um, so one example is in Chicago. The city of Chicago launched their scooter pilot um, this past summer uh, with 10 operators, which is a large number of mobility companies. Um, and one of the key issues that we um, were brought in to help facilitate is evaluating mobility data sharing compliance. Um, one of the key challenges with ingesting these data feeds is that although theoretically they are complying with the data standard, uh, they don't necessarily all look the same. Um, that's one of the interesting things we've uncovered um, working in the space at Populous is that there is still quite a bit of variability in how operators are delivering data to cities. And so we have come in to help verify those data feeds, ensure that each operator is able to deliver the information that's being requested of them. Um, and then for the city to use that information to determine whether or not the operators are complying with specific requirements, such as how many vehicles should be deployed in, in which particular areas. Um, many cities have gone beyond setting vehicle caps or a, a maximum limit on the number of vehicles that an operator can deploy uh, to then also putting in place equity requirements. Um, Chicago, for instance, um, requires that 50% of the total fleet be deployed in two key priority areas. Um, and another issue is that cities can have more immediate access to data that allows them to evaluate incentives and programmatic efforts. Um, when you're operating in the blinds, it's very difficult to see if you're making progress towards specific public goals. And one of the interesting um, opportunities here is that cities can then experiment um, with different incentive programs, um, outreach programs to determine whether or not um, they're being effective in, in expanding access to underserved communities. So I'm going to shift over here to Arlington County in the Washington DC area. Um, they had dockless bikes and scooters since they pretty much first arrived on the ground in uh, the United States. And um, through their their bike share permit, they expanded um, to allow scooter operators to also deploy um, in the county. And one of the things they've been very proactive in doing is identifying um, scooter parking. Uh, so one of the key challenges in the scooter and bike share arena is where should these vehicles be placed? Uh, we suddenly have more smaller devices that we, than we've had in the past, uh, and we don't have um, enough bike infrastructure to support them. Um, Arlington County used our platform to use de-identified GPS data from shared scooters to identify parking spots, mostly on street. Um, and then they were able to design, communicate, and then monitor those new parking infrastructure options um, in partnership with operators. And what they've seen is that many of the operators, now that they have this information about parking areas, are integrating it into their apps for consumers and then directing their users to please kindly use um, those areas, which they have been doing. Um, finally, and this is an area that I hope to see a lot more progress on over the next year, um, is that we're seeing many cities are experiencing many more micromobility trips than they ever had previously with traditional bike services, um, including bike share services that were procured through, through city RFPs, as well as um, personally owned bicycles. Um, many cities have seen significantly more trips. Um, there have been almost 4 million trips in Dallas over the last year. Um, Oakland has surpassed well over a million trips. And now cities are able to use data from these services to start identifying um, where we might need to expand protected lane infrastructure. Um, and one of the exciting opportunities here is that it's just much easier to justify making those investment decisions um, if you have significant data to back it up. For those of you who are interested in learning a little bit more, um, Arlington just released its shared mobility devices um, pilot evaluation report, hot off the press um, as of last week. So I encourage you to download it. Um, some of the key takeaways are that both of the deployment um, of these devices really increased over the course of the pilot, but also the rider response has, so increased utilization rates for these services. Um, 
they're now looking at prioritizing the acceleration of those infrastructure investments that I just mentioned um, to expand bike lanes. Uh, and then one of the other key opportunities for improvement is creating and refining some of the equity expectations. Um, many cities put in place version 1.0 of equity requirements this past year for mobility services. Um, and now that they have access to more data, um, there are actually much more complex ways you can look at that information um, to really drive progress towards those goals. So what are the key opportunities ahead? Um, I think as we look to the future, many cities are really exploring new strategies for more efficient curbside utilization. Um, at Populous, we worked with Lime, which had a car sharing service in Seattle um, to ingest their data directly into our platform to help identify how much parking curbside utilization um, they were using as part of their car sharing permit requirement. Um, many cities would like to then look at how you prioritize and incentivize use of this public space for shared fleets, including curbs and sidewalks. We're seeing a lot of it for bikes and scooters, um, and I'm excited for what the future might bring for other larger shared vehicles um, that we can more efficiently um, move throughout our cities to get more people um, onto transit and into shared vehicles and onto smaller micro-mobility vehicles um, so that we can deliver a better future um, in cities. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the questions. Great. Thank you so much, Regina. A lot of really good information in there. Um, we have a bunch of questions coming in, some about specific cities and policies and some more general. Um, so I'll, I'll start with one that, that I guess could go either way. Um, do you have any examples of when cities and mobility providers were unable to reach an agreement about data sharing after trying? Um, and what was the result of that? And how do you think it could have come out differently? Um, and what might that result have, have led to? That's um, a great question that I will try to answer. I think that one of the key challenges in this particular space is that we've seen um, a lot of rapid change over the last 18 months. Um, and there was definitely an evolution, I believe, in how operators thought about data sharing and approached it initially um, 18 months ago to where we are today. So I think that for the most part, one can imagine most private companies are going to be less inclined to share information um, because they might view sharing that information as increasing you know, risk. Um, and I would say that was certainly true for most private mobility operators 18 months ago. Um, but I think what's interesting, particularly in the case of micromobility, is that a lot of these operators are really only going to be able to expand if, um, if cities also embrace them um, and if they work with them and if they carve out appropriate space for them. Um, and in order to do that, they, can, they, can, they need access to information and data. Um, so I've seen um, pretty huge strides in the parts of cities being able to negotiate data from um, particularly micromobility services. Um, speaking to Eno's experience in the microtransit space, um, I am also, though, familiar with a lot of failed pilots um, through the FTA Mobility On Demand sandbox, where cities were trying to access data for on demand services, and many of those failed, and then contracts shifted from company to company, um, and eventually, I think, landed in the hands of companies that were willing to share the data. <laughs> Great. Uh, there's a bunch of questions about FOIA requests and releasing data um, to citizens. Can you talk a little bit about maybe sort of what the, the general um, requirements and barriers there are relating to FOIA and public records requests, how that varies state to state, um, and then when that data it are when those data are released to citizens, um, how how does that happen, and what's the format and process for that? Um, in this particular circumstance of mobility data and raw disaggregated data, um, I think we're still in the early days of determining how cities and states uh, respond to those public information requests. Um, we are currently, one of the reasons why Populous is part of this SAE Mobility Data Collaborative, which includes public agencies and private companies, um, is to further understand <laughs> what um, the responsibilities are and what precisely should be in permits 
and data security policies and data release policies um, that are retained by cities and then agreements between them and, and operators. So um, we actually will say that we at Populous are aware of uh, public disclosure requests that were attempted to be passed to us as a company, and we were informed by that state and by that city that we were not um, required to disclose anything. Great. Um, and then thinking more about sort of what you do at Populous and some of these other third-party um, data companies, uh, can you talk a little bit about how you've been innovating? Um, you know, what's changed since you started? And uh, there's one specific question here asking if you've been thinking about techniques like machine learning. Um, is there anything that you're thinking about sort of the future of data sharing that we're not quite there yet, but might be in the future? Yeah, um, I, that's a great question. I've been thinking about data sharing since Uber and Lyft first hit the streets in 2011, 2012. <laughs> Um, and didn't think that the regulatory environment um, really was there for this or the technology, basic technology um, building blocks were really ready until we started Populous. And so we really built the company with a vision of helping cities um, ingest data from the growing fleets of shared operators. Um, currently, that primarily includes um, information about where vehicles are located and where trips are taking place. Uh, but you can imagine that these vehicles generate lots and lots of data, and there are also a lot of vehicles that aren't currently operating under that paradigm um, that we would love to help bring online in cities. I think that some of the key um, barriers to getting there are actually more on the policy and regulatory side, not um, technology problems. Got it. And um, related to what barriers there might be, there's a couple questions here about funding. Um, which may be a barrier sometimes when cities are trying to set up new programs or look at data sharing, data analysis. Um, can you think of any specific funding resources or anything innovative different cities have done to help deal with that? What's the, the general state of the practice? Um, we have seen a lot of cities, um, including I think the earliest cities that received stockless bike share programs, um, put in fa put in place uh, permit fee based structures. Um, I am personally not a giant fan of charging small devices for the public space that they use before we charge larger devices <laughs> that use our public space a little bit more um, for the space that they utilize. So I think one of the interesting um, changes that's occurred in the transportation space is because of the emergence of fleet operators such as Uber and Lyft and now um, uh, Bird and Lime and Micro Mobility Services, is there's growing demand for public space. Uh, there are more cities that are thinking about charging for that space in terms of parking fees for personal vehicles or congestion pricing. And I hope that we see much more progress on that front. I know that a lot of cities are currently considering it um, and, and hope that they're able to politically make that happen. Excellent. Um, Here's a question about wait times and specifically looking at um, accessibility with people um, who have specific mobility needs, such as uh, wheelchair accessibility um, or maybe like adaptive bike share options, things like that. Is that something that um, we're collecting data on right now? And if so, what kinds of data do we have and, and how are we and can we be using that? Um, so I'll start first with micromobility. I know that many cities are really encouraging um, operators of micromobility services that have seats and that are more designed to be accessible to a broader um, consortium of, of individuals of different physical abilities. Um, Chicago was one and, and, and Portland is another. Um, I think that when it comes to services like on-demand services, um, we don't really have a lot of data or information um, to really assess uh, those, those questions, but I believe that many cities are going to try to push forward so that they are able to really fully evaluate how these new mobility services can, can really meet the needs of everyone in our city. Great. Thank you. Well, we are right at 4.30, so uh, in respect of everybody's time, I think that's all we have time for.
today. Thank you so much, Regina, for your presentation and for answering all of our questions. Sorry we did not get to everybody's questions today, um, but we will be able to follow up. Uh, and as a reminder, you can find all of the slides um, in a higher resolution on our website um, at the same link that you were able to find the registration for the webinar at. Um, if you go to enotrans.org, you can find those. You can also go there to sign up for Eno Transportation Weekly, which is our valuable resource on all things transportation. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thanks again, Regina, for your time and expertise. And everyone, have a good afternoon. Great. Thanks for having me.